Hello and welcome to the Biz News Breakfast Briefing. I'm Lucy Ferreira for biznews.com. It's Tuesday the 16th of August and as usual today we have Alec Hogg's update on the overnight market movers followed by the global news briefing from our partners the FT in London. In results, if you've been following South African banking shares, we have an in-depth interview on biznews.com today with Koki Koiman, SA's top banking analyst of Denker Capital, looking at why ABSA is a solid buy, expecting about a 50% upside over the next two years in his opinion, following the release of ABSA's interim results yesterday. Head over to biznews.com for that story. And now, it's over to Alec on the markets. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 16th of August. Well, it's kind of muted applause because the markets, although a little firmer, didn't exactly go crazy last night. The S&P 500 index was up by half a percent and NASDAQ was up by 0.6%. Here in South Africa, the JSE All Share Index was just about flat. We'll give it a slight increase because at 70,740, it was nine points up from where it closed on Friday. The RAND, now here's an interesting story. It's been bouncing all over the place. Strengthened really well last week. Yesterday dropped 20 cents against the dollar to 16.43 and 23 cents weaker against the pound, but still under 20 rand. They had 19 rand and 80 cents. A very slight decline against the euro, 16 rand and 68 cents. The big story today is to do with oil, the Brent crude price down by almost $4 a barrel to $94.30. We'll talk about that in a moment. That pulled the gold price lower. They often work in tandem. That was down $20 to $1,782. And then for cryptocurrency fans, Bitcoin, after a fantastic recent run, is catching its breath again down to 24,126, down by 3.3%. And we've got a webinar on crypto uh, at lunchtime today, at noon today. So if you'd like to attend that, it's open to all. Just go onto the Biz News site and you can click uh, on. You, you need to register beforehand. It is open, but you, you have to get the link, obviously. So go onto the, Bitco- uh, uh, onto the Biz News site and you can pick up how to uh, join us at noon. The Geltech basket, and I'm going to be hosting the Geltech experts today. That was down by 2% at 472 rand and 42 cents. Big story on oil, though, is influenced by China. China back front and center as far as the world is concerned. Yesterday, China brought out some data which showed that the economy there, after being opened up a little, over the last two months, is now slowing again. As a consequence of that, the Chinese government have cut interest rates and the hope is that they can start rebuilding economic growth in that country so that President Xi can get his unprecedented third term, basically president for life, in that country by getting the constitution changed there. There's lots going on politically on the uh, on that front and then no doubt uh, this is also influencing what's going on in the market. But with China under pressure, and the reason it's under pressure, and I guess here in South Africa we should be thanking our lucky stars that we don't have a government that is completely enthralled to their Chinese friends in BRICS because the Chinese decided on a zero COVID policy. So what they've done there is they have got pretty bad vaccines and the vaccinations don't really work. They've got an old population because of the one-child policy and so they need to be extremely cautious about COVID. They haven't let it rip as has happened in the rest of the world here in South Africa. For the most part, people just ignored it and I'm not talking about the first world component of the economy where um, many people did wear masks but if you go into the townships and into the rural areas, uh, things were very different. Anyway, in South Africa, we're now through the, the COVID issue and we've seen the difference in the economy. In China, they're still trying to not have COVID. So when there is an outbreak, there's, they're sealing off parts of the cities or uh, the country and not being terribly successful because this Omicron is highly contagious. By closing off the, econo- the cities, they're affecting the economy And now China is trying to do something else to offset the damage that's been caused by the lockdowns and the zero COVID policy. An interesting alternative to what's happened in the Western world, which is much freer and has allowed um, the COVID 
pandemic to work its way through and out of the system, supported by the private sector, which created vaccines, which made it a heck of a lot um, less vulnerable, made people a lot less vulnerable to this virus. The Chinese economy being in such trouble had an immediate impact on oil, obviously, because China consumes about 15% of world's oil. Also weighing on the oil price was Saudi Aramco, recently listed the biggest, most valuable company in the world and, of course, the biggest oil producer in the world, saying that it's going to boost production over the next five years. So that has an obvious impact on the oil price, but so too is the concern of China's impact on the global economy. We also saw commodity prices falling yesterday. Uh, Copper was down by about 1.5%. There, China consumes half of the world's refined copper. So you can see the story. The commodity prices are very dependent on what happens in China at the moment, and China is not doing well, so that's why we see a uh, reduction in the prices there. Okay, on to the United States. There, stocks went higher, and the story on this side is all to do with inflation. The concern that people had a year ago about inflation rising has now been replaced by an anticipation that inflation is going to fall. They're getting signals coming from the housing market, which has cooled down, from companies' results, which is telling us that uh, price increases are ameliorating somewhat, from the bond market and even from consumers. And so the projection that uh, the market is now putting forward through the derivatives, uh, derivative trading is that inflation will come down to about between 3 and 4% over the next few months. And that means that the Federal Reserve in America won't have to increase interest rates as aggressively. And that means stocks won't be as uh, badly affected. And that means the share prices, which had been bashed down to, uh, well, levels that saw the NASDAQ 30% lower in a year, uh, in the year so far, rather, uh, in June, are going to then be able to improve. So all of that's weighing on the markets and the stocks continue to go higher uh, in anticipation that inflation is not going to be such a big problem. Here in South Africa, well, we've had uh, some interesting moves yesterday. We had results from APSA. You can go and listen to that interview that I did with Koki Koiman, who's the country's top financial services analyst. He was very impressed. It lifted the other banking shares higher as well. Apps itself was up by another 1%. And we've done well with that one. It went into the portfolio, the business uh, model share portfolio, at 159 Rand. It's now at 188 Rand, and that's only in six weeks. But in the same period, we've seen first Rand. Uh, it's now at just under 70 Rand a share. That's come from 60 Rand. was up at one and a quarter percent in sympathy with Apps's results yesterday. Nedbank also higher yesterday. That's gone from... 200 rand to 220 rand in the past month and standard bank's gone from 144 rand to 172 rand in the past month so financial services shares but particularly the big banks have really um, been justifying the confidence that Corky Coyman has been uh, telling us about for the last little while and industrial shares continue uh, to impress in certain areas Novus which was the spin-off the printing spin-off from NASPAS was up another 4% yesterday. Uh, so it's now at 3 Rand and 7 cents. This one was around about 50 cents a little while ago. Uh, it's still looking at uh, continued improvement. Um, well, certainly there are traders who are getting into that one. But on the other hand, we've seen ArcelorMittal down 4% yesterday at 5 Rand 85. This one was over 10 Rand in April. Uh, a similar story for Wilson Bailey, which was dropped another 4% yesterday to 86 Rand. In mid-July, this one was at 98 Rand a share. So that rally has now petered out. And one of my more favorite shares, Afrimat, is down to 50 Rand yesterday. That was off 4%. In April, that was at 76 Rand. So it hasn't been this low since December last year, but Afrimat, Afrimat produces um, the kind of materials that are most affected by an international de downturn in commodities. So I guess it's not too surprising to see that that's been under pressure. Good morning from the Financial Times. Today is Tuesday, August 16th, and this is your FT News Briefing. 
China has eased a crucial lending rate to try and boost its economy. Kenya has a new president, but he still faces a challenge. And private equity dealmakers used to be ruthless, but they've evolved into cooperative rivals. And so that changes the way you behave versus if you're just trying to win one single deal and trying to rip the next guy's throat out. We'll talk to a correspondent about how private equity has changed over the decades. I'm Jess Smith, in for Mark Filipino, and here's the news you need to start your day. It took almost a week, but election officials in Kenya yesterday finally announced a winner in the recent presidential election. Deputy President William Ruto just barely defeated former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. Their battle to lead one of Africa's largest economies was fiercely fought, and Odinga and some other officials are challenging the results. Everyone is kind of on tenterhooks now, waiting what's going to happen. The FT's East and Central Africa correspondent Andres Skipani points to past elections in 2007 and 2017 that ended in violence. So Kenya is seen as beacon stability in the Horn of Africa until election happens. A lot of people are hoping that this election, despite the legal challenge, could break the cycle of violence that happened in previous elections and would actually could lead to a smoother transition of power. Andres, what happens next now that Odinga is challenging Ruto's victory? We will likely see somebody from his side challenging the results in the Supreme Court. If there's a successful petition, this could annul the presidential election, and this this would require a fresh vote within the next 60 days, following that judgment. The judiciary has been quite independent, but there's going to be a massive political pressure on this to be sorted one way or the other. So... We'll have to wait and see. Andres Skipani is the FT's East and Central Africa correspondent. Iran's government yesterday denied involvement in the knife attack on British writer Salman Rushdie. Rushdie was speaking at an event in the U.S. on Friday when he was stabbed multiple times. He remains in critical condition. It was Iran's former supreme leader who more than 30 years ago authorized Muslims to kill Rushdie. He alleged that Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, was blasphemous. The FT's Tehran correspondent, Najme Bazorgmer, says Iran has changed its position. When in 1998, reformists came to power and wanted to normalize ties with Britain, promised that the Islamic Republic would not send assassins from Iran to carry out that religious decree and kill Salman Rushdie. But of course, this also means that Iran could not stop other Muslims from around the world to go ahead. The official comment sticks to that commitment that Iran would not get involved in this as a state, but Iran also sympathizes with people who do that because Rushdie, Iran says, is accused of blasphemy. But Najme says the timing of the attack on Rushdie has come under scrutiny. It happened just as Iran is in negotiations with the U.S. and Europe over the Iran nuclear accord. And it comes a week after U.S. officials charged an Iranian national with plotting to assassinate former U.S. national security advisor John Bolton. There is a lot of conspiracy here about the timing. So for Iranian commentators, these two are not accidental. At the time, the EU has put forward a proposal for Iran to sign an agreement with the US and other global powers and revive the 2015 nuclear deal. So the conspiracy is hardliners, wherever they are in Tehran or Washington, they are trying to create some kind of crisis so that it makes it difficult for Biden administration to sign a deal with a country that presumably has ordered assassination of John Bolton and has also authorized stabbing Salman Rushdie. Iran's immediate reaction was this just doesn't make any sense and Iran rejected it outright, any involvement. That's our Tehran correspondent, Najme Bazorgmer.
China's central bank yesterday cut its medium-term lending rate by 10 basis points to two and three quarters of a percent. It's an attempt to shore up growth in an economy battered by COVID lockdowns, a property crisis, and slowing global growth. China's economy is now the world's second largest, and it almost contracted last quarter. Other recent indicators showed worse than expected consumer and factory activity. Youth unemployment rose to a record of nearly 20 percent. Yesterday's move by the People's Bank of China is the first rate cut since January. A big business software company called Zendesk struck a deal earlier this summer to be taken private. It was a pretty straightforward private equity deal. Two buyout firms would buy the company from shareholders for about $10 billion and take it off the public stock market. But the FT's Antoine Gara says he was struck by the way the private equity firms worked with each other to make this deal happen. Well, I've been covering the industry for over a decade, and The story for the decade after the financial crisis was private equity taking business from regulated banks like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. But what I had also begun to notice is that as that story had played out, there was a new story emerging where the firms had grown so large, they were essentially interconnected. Now, when private equity first got off the ground in the U.S., it was the 1970s, and the players were mostly small groups of former bankers battling each other for deals. Antoine describes them as swashbuckling takeover artists. Now, they're established gatekeepers. They are working much more closely together and are not just rivals and enemies, um, but they're now also each other's customers. So, The firms themselves have gone from being somewhat mercenary deal-making firms where they were just looking to win a single zero-sum deal to now much broader financial institutions where they the value of their relationships is much more than what they can win in a single deal. You're creating repeat business with each other, you know, that you'll be working together for years or even decades. And so that changes the way you behave um, versus if you're just trying to win one single deal and trying to rip the, the next guy's throat out. And these days, private equity firms don't just do buyouts. They lend money to other companies. They lend money to competitors to finance deals. So they've become sort of a private version of the public financial system. Now the industry collectively manages over $5 trillion just for corporate buyouts. And then when you add in together everything else they do, like real estate investments and insurance-related investments, that figure rises to $10 trillion. And collectively, the industry is actually the largest owner of businesses in the world. And so a company like Blackstone, in effect, owns you know, more businesses and its portfolio employs more people than a company like Walmart. And that size, as well as the cozy interconnectedness of the powerful private equity firms, has U.S. regulators taking action. In the past, the general sense was that since private equity firms just go buy companies on behalf of their investors and are a small part of the market, there weren't significant antitrust concerns. But these regulators have come to the FT and said that now they're considering private equity deals in the same light as, you know, a large company buying a competitor, a sales force or something like that, who's going to buy a competitor. Traditionally, those kinds of deals have faced really significant antitrust review. And it seems like, um, as private equity firms, uh, strike you know, similar size deals and consolidate industries, the antitrust regulators are going to be taking a much closer look. Antoine Gara is the FT's U.S. private and institutional capital correspondent. You can read more on all these stories at FT.com. This has been your daily FT News Briefing. Make sure you check back tomorrow for the latest business news.